Hello everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you today to our latest GSMA IoT web talk on delivering 5G quality of service uh, for connected and automated driving. I am Holly Westerman and I'm a project manager at the GSMA currently working on automotive projects that are going on. So if we can go to the next slide, I can introduce you to our speakers for today. Here we go. So we have a fantastic panel with us today, uh, starting with Johannes Springer from T-System. We also have Jochen Klink from T-System. We have Armit Rosenberg from Atopia. And our moderator for the interactive panel today will be Shane Rooney from the GSMA. So if we go to the next slide, we can take a look at the agenda. So we're going to kick off with Johannes, who will provide an introduction to 5G quality of service. And then we'll go into a joint presentation from Joachim and Amit on teleoperations. This will be followed with the interactive panel, and we will also have opportunity for a live audience Q&A session at the end. So if you'd like to get involved, please do so. Uh, you can submit your questions by clicking the Q&A button, which should be on the right hand side of your screen. Um, once you've submitted your questions, uh, we will aim to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A session at the end. So before we kick things off with the main presentation, uh, I just want to cover a little bit about some of the socioeconomic benefits of connected vehicles and why CV2X. So let's just quickly, if we go back a slide. There we go. So let's just quickly look at a little bit of information um, about what the benefits are of having over 500 million connected vehicles on the road by 2025. Currently, there are 1.35 million lives lost uh, every year due to road traffic accidents. And as you can see, a huge percentage of vehicle collisions are down to human error. So there is a real uh, safety benefit of having all of these connected vehicles on the road. But there are also some wider societal benefits as well such as improved traffic flow, reduced congestion, reduced emissions, and just general improved driving efficiency. And when we're talking about connected vehicles, um, we're not just talking about vehicles talking to each other here. We're also talking about vehicles talking to infrastructure and pedestrians, and how this communication can really improve quality of life. So if we go to the next slide, So why cellular V2X? Cellular V2X is leveraging the existing technology of 4G LTE networks, and these networks are already commercially globally available. There is also a sustainable roadmap as we move from 4G to 5G, and this evolution to 5G is actually really important as it will help the enablement of fully automated and connected vehicles, and this is due to improvements in things such as bandwidth, latency, and reliability. If we go to the next slide. And as you can see here, it's also worth mentioning that cellular V2X is backed by a global ecosystem and that it ranges from mobile operators to insurers and suppliers from the wider industry. And when we look at what's actually needed for these connected vehicle solutions, we can see how mobile operators our best place for this as they're already providing an established and a trusted network infrastructure which allows for scale uh, coverage reliability and end-to-end -end security and as we're mentioning security it's also important to note that cellular v2x is based on uh, internationally recognized interoperable standards that are leveraging security services provided by the mobile networks so if we go to the next slide we can just take a very quick look at what the gsma are doing so here at the GSMA, um, we're working on a number of projects at the moment within automotive with the mobile operators and the OEMs. OEMs. And the purpose of uh, these projects really are to try and help accelerate connected vehicles. If you'd like to find out some more on what we're doing, then you can visit our website at gsma.com forward slash automotive. Or if you'd like to get involved in some of the projects and the work that we're doing, you can also contact us. And our contact details are on the next slide. 
So that's it from me, and I would now like to hand over to our first speaker, Johannes Springer from T-Systems. Yeah, thank you very much, Oli, for this good introduction. Welcome to everybody here on this web conference. I would like to give uh, you, based also on the previous information and introduction Holy has done so far, uh, some insights about one of the very important topics when it comes to 5G and automotive, and uh, that is uh, specifically the quality of service aspect. As Holly has mentioned, a lot of services, also more, more mission critical services in the automotive industry are um, related to the use of cellular networks and therefore quality of service is of course a, a very important topic. If you could switch to the next slide, please. Um, here you can see the major topics we as Deutsche Telekom are foreseeing when it comes to 5G automotive. Uh, and that is, of course, um, the, the whole um, integration of traffic infrastructure uh, with narrowband IoT and LTM topics. This, of course, a 5G as a new radio uh, technology. This is the introduction and inclusion of other traffic participants um, for with uh, direct communication, cellular vehicle to X uh, direct communication mode. There's the introduction of mobile edge computing new technologies like precise positioning and positioning integrity. And of course, don't forget that uh, this is not only of, uh, about connecting the vehicles, but also connecting the customers who are sitting in the cars via dual active SIM uh, environments and other stuff. So I would like to concentrate today on uh, the quality of service aspects of uh, 5G networks. And I would like to give you some examples and some uh, very brief introduction how we as mobile network operators are working on this topic. Next slide, please. So if uh, we take quality of service into consideration, we clearly see uh, four major pillars the um, mobile network operators are working on. Of course, first of all, we are working co on continuous network expansion. We are spreading our network all over the whole country and of course all over the whole transportation network the roads and the railways and of course for certain reasons also the waterways um, we are also working intensively on uh, network uh, slicing aspects to provide quality of service regardless uh, of the, the of the consumption of the bandwidth by other customers so to give priority to those services which really need uh, the quality of service and Holy has mentioned uh, some of the examples like safety relevant services like emergency call and other services which are safety critical and safety relevant in the vehicle. Of course we need to accept that from time to time quality of service might be not um, uh, available uh, in a reasonable um, in a reasonable level and that is the reason why we are also working on uh, the predictability of quality of service. And I would like to give some examples also to this. And finally, um, uh, the car manufacturers are selling their vehicles uh, on a global market. Uh, so more than 200 countries need to be, um, uh, uh, need to be able to connect the vehicles in, in the way um, the car manufacturers and at the end the customers are expecting. Next slide, please. So when it comes to Continuous network expansion, I would like to give you uh, one example here out of Germany, uh, and that is a very clear indication that all the network operators are working intensively to provide coverage uh, all over the transportation network, all over the road network, but also all over the rail network. And that is a clear indication of today's uh, auctioning processes, of today's coverage requirements, which are set by the regulators. So we can clearly uh, estimate and expect um, from from uh, from uh, various uh, network deployment scenarios that mobile network coverage will be provided all over the transportation network. Next slide, please. Um, with regard to um, with regard to network slicing, we have this type of technology already today in our networks, uh, not in the public networks, but in the campus networks. Uh, we have um, already split and uh, organized various slices for different types 
of applications. One slice for public um, uh, available um, uh, applications, which don't need that high level of quality of service and other applications which are have mission uh, uh, critical characteristics where we can provide a certain degree of KPI according to the needs of the application. So this is already there. Uh, this can be already um, uh, deployed in various campus projects. And of course, this type of technology will be also very soon available in the public networks. Next slide, please. So when it comes um, to the um, question how these type of splicing aspects will be used for a variety of services, of course, one very a good example and prominent example is teleoperation. It is clear that the teleoperated uh, vehicle can only uh, be managed properly if a certain level of KPIs is uh, guaranteed uh, at the location at a certain point um, in, in on the on the road network, and that is the reason why we will hear later uh, something more about uh, teleoperation, uh, teleoperated driving. Next slide, please. When it comes to uh, the question of uh, predictability, of course we need to uh, accept that from time to time a mobile network is not able to fulfill um, the um, the requested uh, KPIs properly, and that is the reason why we are working intensively to provide information in advance to the vehicle which is uh, which is using this information to adopt the application uh, in a way that um, no um, um, major problems are uh, occurring in the vehicles and uh, that the service which is available for the customer can be um, can be uh, degraded uh, accordingly so next uh, if you click a, a bit Thank you very much. So uh, you can assume that uh, that the vehicle is requesting uh, to an um, uh, to an uh, central interface of the mobile network operators a request and gets an answer based on um, intensive uh, artificial uh, intelligence uh, enhanced um, uh, analytics, which gets all the data which is available in the in the network to provide um, uh, an answer. Next uh, click, please. To provide an answer to the vehicle uh, to um, to get information about the available KPI characteristics alongside the road. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. So finally, of course, the whole thing needs to be provided on a global basis. So um, teleoperation, but also other services needs to be provided not only in one country, not only in Europe, but also in all the countries and all the uh, global markets where the vehicles are sold. So um, that is the reason why uh, network operators, of course, uh, have to provide global coverage and uh, global availability of quality of service uh, all over um, the, the, the automotive markets. And not only with regard to, to these type of roaming contracts, what you can see here. Next slide, please. Uh, but also, uh, to the type of um, how the traffic, how the mobile traffic is organized in these networks and assume you have these type of uh, central uh, cloud uh, data centers uh, spread all over the globe. Of course, you need to uh, smartly uh, and smoothly and intelligently um, organize the traffic between the vehicle and the various uh, cloudlets in a way that you uh, receive and get access to the quality of service parameters the applications want to have. So with that, I would like to stop here and I would like to hand over uh, to my uh, dear colleague. Next slide, please. Uh, this is only a uh, uh, short thank you very much for your attention. Uh, to my dear colleague Joachim Klink, who will give you a bit more insights into teleoperated driving. And of course, it's obvious that teleoperated driving needs these type of quality of service parameters, as I have mentioned. Thank you very much for the time being, and Joachim, the floor is yours. Thanks, Johannes, and um, yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me now. Um, I will actually share this, the floor with Amit Rosenzweig from Atopia, as mentioned. 
let's go on the next slide and, and set the base for this discussion. Um, because, of course, vehicles are already connected um, quite a bit. We know about uh, 200, roughly 200 different uh, services and use cases of connected cars. We actually provide them for a couple of um, customers. And um, this is the current um, state of technology um, when it comes to these services. Uh, when it comes to the actual technology, how cars are connected, on the other side, what the requirements are. On the left upper side, we have um, services like uh, telemetry data or vehicle stats. Um, they require almost nothing from a bandwidth and latency perspective. Yeah, it doesn't matter if the data comes in a few hours later, I would even argue. Uh, and of course, that, that's not a lot of data. On the other side, um, the um, right lower corner, um, we are reaching the single digit of Mbit uh, per second uh, requirements in terms of bandwidth. When we talk about off-board navigation, when we talk about internet in the car, when we talk about HD videos delivered, um, in terms of latency, um, videos can be buffered, so there is no need for a real uh, second. It's probably a, whatever, a few seconds is no big deal. If we, if we talk about internet um, or off-board navigation, we're getting closer to um, the one second. Now, if we look for, forward uh, and we talk about not only connected cars, but also autonomous automated cars, if, if we talk about electric vehicles, so the whole case portfolio, um, this is a little bit of a different picture. Uh, in, in brief, we see 20 times more bandwidth, 20 times plus, and also 20 times better or shorter latency. This is roughly the challenge we're facing. If, if we want to upload sensor data from LiDAR and radars from autonomous cars, for example, for the engineers um, to really work with that data, and we've, if we screen this out of a moving car, uh, for example, you, you won't always do this, of course, um, but that would require a, mo a lot more bandwidth than just um, uh, looking at HD videos. Uh, same is true for, for over-the-air updates. Um, usually you try to offload this from a moving car into whatever the Wi-Fi of the driver's home or maybe the, the garage and repair shops. Um, but still there are use cases and there is use for that kind of um, uh, yeah, technology. In terms of latency, as Johannes mentioned, we're not, we're first of all, not talking about just uh, infotainment and luxury stuff. We're talking about safety crit critical um, uh, use cases and services. And again, we're down to milliseconds. Uh, we're, not, we're not okay with one second of delay. Yeah, we need to come, come down to a tenth of a second or even lower, um, maybe only 10 milliseconds. And um, I'll show you why in the next slide. Uh, actually, uh, yeah. So that's why we need this kind of um, latency and also availability. The current services are just about, I would say, business process optimization, uh, a little bit of fun and convenience in the car, uh, a little bit of productivity. Um, so we're always good with 99.90% of availability. Uh, can you click one time, please? Yes, thank you. Um, if we talk about uh, eCall as the only safety critical function currently available, uh, we should go a little bit higher in the 99.95% of availability, uh, but sometimes even that is uh, provided on a 99.9 level. And then if we talk about teleoperation, ADAS function, talk, cars talking to other cars and, and to infrastructure, so these kind of services, this is all safety critical. We're really risking lives and the health of, of persons. And that's why we need an increase of availability. So that in combination, the higher bandwidth, the lower latency that, that technically a service works and also the availability uh, for that kind of service. That uh, all together, this is of course, 
the challenge we're facing. And that's why we need something like quality of services, predicted quality of services, guaranteed uh, quality of services to make these use cases happen and, and, and safe. Now let's talk about teleoperation as probably the one of these services which hits the road um, earliest um, according, as, uh, according to 5GAA roadmaps and also um, is quite demanding in terms of bandwidth and latency. If you want to steer a car from remote, um, you need to have the same view, almost the same view like the driver itself. Um, and, and that means, let's say, four HD video streams. Um, with these four HD video streams, you still have only one, uh, 50 times less pixel than one human eye. This is the environment perception you get. It's, it's still much less than you would have when you would sit in the car, but I would say it's good enough. Yeah, that is what you need. Um, although it's 50 times less perception, you already um, kind of block 50% of, of a single radio cell. Yeah, not in, in, in practice. Yeah, if you're out there on an highway, whatever, on a street. So that's the kind of challenge we're facing. Now we're talking LTE, current state of the networks. Uh, of course, that becomes a lot better with 5G, but that's the current state and it has to work everywhere and anytime, right? Uh, so that's the kind of um, bandwidth challenge we're, we're seeing here. On the latency side, uh, one more click, please. Um, we have uh, the issue that we don't see where the car is exactly. Imagine this is what you see on your screen, um, an obstacle in front of you and your car. And this is really what you see on these screens. Now, if you're driving with 30 kilometers per hour roughly, and we have 100 milliseconds of latency, the car is already uh, one meter more ahead, more closer to the obstacle. And if you then turn the steering wheel or hit the brake, the car will drive one more meter before it starts to react to your control command. That is the issue you're facing as a driver from remote. And that is, of course, what explains the high demand for bandwidth, latency, and also, of course, availability. Because if something happens in this point in time, you're just crashing the obstacle or whatever, driving into a person on the street. Imagine that. that. That is the ultimate challenge of teleoperations and these kind of use cases. And now one more um, uh, perspective onto this, the next slide. Um, well, we all know these conditions, the conditions of a network, they change constantly, right? You cannot say it's good at that uh, location. It's good at that time at that location. It changes over time also depending on the consumption which is in the same cell um, because if other cars are entering the same cell and let's in a traffic jam you probably have experienced that everybody tries to reach someone or whatever tries to stream videos uh, this of course um, then hits your own personal bandwidth and that is why we need something like quality of services and network slicing. So we can guarantee the safety critical uh, services and we can split uh, the video signals uh, between whatever uh, a Netflix, um, I'm bored type of service versus a safety critical service like um, teleoperations. Now, how you deal with this and how this can be solved I would like to hand over to Amit, wasn't why from Utopia. They have solved all of that, and uh, I'm glad that we have an expert like Amit uh, in this call who can explain this to you. Amit, your floor. Thank you very much, Joa, for the kind introduction. You're too kind. Uh, so, hi, everybody. My name is Amit Rosenzweig. I'm the CEO and founder of a company called Utopia, and we specialize in teleoperation solutions for various needs, including autonomous driving. So, uh, let's start. Next slide, please. So, just to be clear on what is the problem that we as a company are trying to solve, the problem is as follows. Uh, autonomy is something that is very, very difficult to build. 
and across multiple industries, not just in mobility and transportation, but also in logistics and mining, uh, shipping ports, airports, and mostly because life is full of edge cases in every single industry. There are edge cases. It could be a construction site. It could be a police officer on the road. It could be a misplaced uh, pallet or a box if we're talking about uh, an autonomous forklift that is trying to, to pick up the box, et cetera, et cetera. And the concept of teleoperation says that uh, the human being can help the robot. The human being can help the autonomous machine, be it a small machine like a delivery robot or even a big machine like a forklift or a construction equipment. Uh, and the way to do it is, of course, remotely. Uh, so you can safely intervene from far away as a human, and you can get a very good ratio of, for example, one human being, one teleoperator, versus 10, 15, 20 autonomous machines. So it's also not just safe, but also economical. Next slide, please. There are many use cases for uh, autonomy, and therefore there are many use cases for teleoperation, because almost always, in most cases, teleoperation augments and complements the autonomy in order to make autonomy real, in order to make autonomy deployed. Um, and a teleoperation helps to deal with any possible edge case, be it on the uh, public road fleets, like last mile delivery shuttles, taxis, and freight, or more uh, geofenced areas, like uh, shipping ports, airports. Uh, construction sites, etc. So we are talking about a product that is not just um, related to smart mobility and autonomous driving of autonomous fleets for, for robot taxis. We're also talking about uh, AGVs, AMRs, all sorts of uh, robots, uh, robotic applications. Next slide. In high level, on one side, you have a control center, a teleoperation center. On the other, you have the, the fleet fleet of machines, fleet of robot taxis, etc. And it enables, the product enables three value propositions. Remote monitoring, remote assistance is to actually provide help, not just to passively get the live data, live video streams. And last but not least, remote driving, remote manipulation to actually steer the machine, control the machine, and not just give assistance and commands. Next slide. Uh, we will now show uh, a very short video just to see how it works. Okay, so this is a, a demonstration of how a, how a teleoperation uh, station looks like. And this is a this is a film, an actual movie of of how the product is in action. On one side, you have the teleoperator. Uh, she can view incoming live feed, multiple cameras. It can be five, six, seven, eight cameras, according to the need. She's actually now, uh, in this demonstration, she's driving uh, the vehicle from far away. In most use cases, it's an autonomous vehicle. Uh, she has all sorts of assistance measures to understand if she's getting too close. Uh, if you can see, there is, a, for example, a blue line in the center screen. Sometimes it turns red to notify her that there is a, a danger coming. Uh, and the control can be complete 100% over the vehicle, or the con con control can be something more lean, uh, more gentle, uh, when it's about interacting with the autonomy. We're not showing here all the modes of control. We are showing here the, the most difficult thing, which is the complete takeover of uh, remote driving. Um, let's go back to the, to the slides, please. Okay. In terms of interfaces, teleoperation is not just about having one human supervise multiple cars or multiple forklifts, etc. There's also um, complementary products and dashboards that are more for the fleet manager. Uh, example: if you if you if you want to operate a robot taxi service somewhere, you need to understand where there is sufficient quality of service to operate. 
and where there is perhaps not, maybe the quality is, is not sufficient to, to do remote driving, remote assistance. And also, if you want to investigate what happened on Thursday evening to a particular session, particular vehicle, then you need to have those dashboards as well in terms of latency breakdown, uh, bandwidth, all the quality of service parameters. Next, please. Um, and in terms of the technology, it is considered in the industry that there are at least five elements. Uh, th there are more, but the critical ones are uh, on screen. We will very quickly uh, cover them because it's not just about the network. So I will start on the right side with your permission. On the right end, we have the integration layer. So teleoperation is never standalone. It's, uh, it's always part of something bigger, a deployment in an airport or a deployment in mining site, etc. Therefore, it must be integrated easily with the fleet management layer, with the autonomy layer, etc. Cybersecurity, easier said than done, uh, needs to be thought about from the beginning, from the get-go, before even developing the first line of code. Uh, any provider needs to think about how can this be secure? Uh, if somebody takes over the teleoperation center, that's, that's a very bad thing. So we need to do everything in, in our minds, everything in, in our power to prevent those things from happening. Similar topic is safety. Uh, we need to make sure that even if the connection breaks down surprisingly or the latency is too high surprisingly or the human operator makes a mistake, there are the safety systems and, and measurements in place to prevent bad stuff from happening, even if it's a very low speed application like a forklift. Still, a crash cannot happen during a teleoperation session. And there are ways to ensure that, and that, again, it goes beyond the scope of just the networking and the video technology. Speaking of which, the last two parts, of course, that are needed are, are how to predict uh, quality of service. We do that not alone. We do, we do that with, with partners, similar, like exactly like uh, T-Systems, Deutsche Telekom. How to know to combine various channels together to get an increased bandwidth and less latency. Etc. And, and many other technologies for the network piece. Last but not least, the video itself. Latency is not just about the network pipeline. It's also about all the processing that happens on the vehicle side, for example, encoding, encryption, and all the processing that happens on the teleoperation side, uh, decoding the streams, decrypting them, rendering the video, and all the other types of information that are needed for the operator to see and understand and hear. So there is the middle part of latency in the network, but in the beginning and in the end, and of course on the other way around when providing the, the help and the commands, there are also parts that must be optimized in terms of the video technology. Next, please. So thank you very much for this uh, short introduction about the teleoperation side. And now I will uh, give it back to Shane for the discussion. Thank you, Amr. Um, I'd like to welcome back Johannes and uh, Joachim to our panel discussion, which we're going to have now. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your interesting developments on, on quality of service uh, and teleoperations. Uh, and I'm going to drill down a little bit more um, in a moment. But I'd just like to remind the audience that you can send me your questions as well. And I'll try and combine those in there and uh, ask our, our presenters uh, their opinion. So please feel free to, to send us your questions. We've got quite a lot at this moment. Uh, so I'll do my best to try and get as much as we can in on that. But I'd like to start maybe perhaps on 5G itself. And um, that's, you know, the hype around autonomous vehicles uh, seems to be sort of coming to an end and it's down to business now. It's down to action and start implementing it. Um, what's your perception and how urgent do you think we need uh, 5G and connected uh, vehicles? Maybe I should start with you, Johannes, on, on that particular one uh, as, as a mobile operator. 
Yeah, thank you, Shane, and, and thank you also for the question. I think what Amit has um, uh, described in his uh, presentation um, uh, very in a very good, uh, let's say, manner that autom to bring automation into the field means you need to deal with the edge use cases. So if you have not an answer for these edge use cases, automation will be very hardly uh, uh, can be sold. Yeah? Whether it's a whether it's a harbor case. Where you want to, um, where you want to um, automate, automate uh, the driving for um, for shuttling the containers, whether it's valet parking in the automotive industry or even highway a chauffeur. So if a, if a, if on a highway an automated driving vehicle uh, gets a problem and needs to stop on the right hand side, of course this is a safe, this is a safe behavior. But is it really operational and the selling proposition to the customer? That is something. Uh, we we need to make a, a big question mark, and that is the reason why we believe that tiller operation is a very important uh, functionality to come or to overcome these type of limitations of of these edge cases, and to to, to give an appropriate solution to that. Does it really need 5G in a way that it needs to work with uh, only 5G new radio? Definitely no, no. Uh, what what uh, Joachim has shown very good. Is that a lot of use cases uh, need uh, bandwidth, which we can also uh, provide today with LTE and 4G. But what is needed uh, is uh, that we have a controlled behavior, that we have a guaranteed service level, what Amit has shown in this presentation. And that is something we as a mobile network operator strongly believe that we need to provide quality of service for this type of mission critical services like teleoperation. And, and really on that note, we, we know that 5G, we're not going to have 5G everywhere. It's not going to be 100% coverage out there. So if I flip it to a, uh, an OEM manufacturer, um, why would they invest in this technology now? Uh, and, uh, you know, especially when they're sort of thinking about maybe critical use cases like ADAS. Um, May, may, Joachim, is there some comments you may have on that? Sure, yeah. Um, look, if if you want to implement um, services like ADAS, automated assisted, um, even autonomous driving, you're relying on a lot of sensors in the car. And of course, there is this approach, the car is a standalone and and fully functional thing and doesn't require any network at all yeah it this is a potential technical approach uh, on the other side even in this car you're combining different sensors different technologies to fulfill only one functionality and for me the network capabilities um, it's just one more sensor one more additional technology you add to the equation and um, so ultimately, of course, you don't necessarily need um, 5G, but it makes uh, it accelerates the introduction of ADAS. Some use cases like cooperative maneuvers only work with it. Yeah, you, you cannot even do them without it um, because talk, cars has to talk to, it, to other cars and to the infrastructure. And um, that's why I think they should um, yeah, definitely factor this in into their um, developments and it will accelerate and, and probably even um, provide a little bit more cost efficiency in a lot of use cases yeah probably it's not working for everything and everywhere as we also know from the current connected car services yeah, you will find spots where the coverage is not good at all um, but the majority of the roads, um, according to regulations, will be covered and uh, with quality of service and, and also what we've seen in, in Amit's presentation with a, a, a certain technology approach, what covers potential um, downsides of the network, uh, all this together provides a safe solution. Amit, do you have anything you could add to that? Uh, not a lot. Very, very briefly, I will say that, yes, 5G is, uh, is a great benefit. But for some of the use cases, including in 
but we see, we humbly see uh, teleoperation, a lot is already applicable today and LTEA. Uh, we, have, we have customers that do not have access to 5G. It's not, it's not there yet in terms of geographical uh, coverage, but they are using um, teleoperation um, using LTE and LTEA as long as the the, techno the right technology is in place, which which enables that. Uh, in, in this case, it us. It could be, it could be other uh, other uh, use cases and other vendors. But uh, we 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 see it, the enablement of some of the use cases that we described uh, here today, even before 5G. But def definitely, 5G has a lot of uh, a lot of upside. Uh, for example, you can uh, you can do remote driving faster. You can you can enable higher speeds, not because we want to be unsafe, but rather because we want to, to cover more use cases that perhaps require faster speeds, and, and that can be unlocked thanks to the introduction of 5G coverage. And, and speaking of, of the technology uh, and teleoperations as a service, um, do you see that uh, being provided on existing connected vehicle platforms or do you think there's going to be different uh, platforms for different serve different purposes? Um, how how would that work, and when do you think that will happen? So we already, in terms of the when, I'll start with the last part of the question. The when is right now. We already see customers. We have customers that are using the technology uh, beyond the, the scope of pilots and demonstrations and POCs. So the when is now. Some some companies. That are dealing with autonomous deployment, like uh, like robo taxis, like uh, robo shuttles. Uh, they already made up their mind in terms of which technologies and which vendors uh, they are working with. The decisions were made in order to to fully integrate and use uh, the technology uh, already, and and especially next year. Uh, so the when for many types of industries and customers is is right now. And in terms of the specifics of what kind of, of platforms are used, so yes, we are talking about um, auton all sorts of autonomous machines, and they're not using uh, what you may uh, refer to as the standard connectivity platforms, the standard modems that you may find in uh, in existing cars of, of consumer consumer cars. They're using more than one modem, for example, on each unit. They're using other types of modem, higher categories uh, that have access to the latest and greatest uh, uh, frequencies, uh, not just LTE, but LTE plus, LTE advanced. So uh, from what we see, it's not the standard connectivity platforms that are used, for example, in the automotive industry, in the volume production of consumer cars. It's more um, premium, let's call it, um, uh, connectivity platforms. Uh, with the necessary redundancy and the necessary support of frequency to to enable the use case that that we know about, which is teleoperation. Uh, with that being said, there are other use cases that we are not the experts for who could use uh, the standard, for example, connectivity platforms that you may find in the new uh, connected cars. And if, right. if I may add, from a um, if you, if you talk about the back end. The platform which is outside the car, yeah, as I as I uh, presented, we're talking 20 times higher requirements, but already the current portfolio has a spread of uh, a factor of 10,000. So for us, um, actually, we would integrate uh, an Atopia core solution like we do a weather or whatever streaming or e-call, which, which always comes from a certain spe specific partner, specialized on that single use case, and that would be need to be integrated into an overall platform because, of course, um, the OEMs don't want to end up with 20 different um, backend platforms. Yeah, that's not really co cost efficient. So we would, and, and cloud technologies, microservices, architectures, that makes it possible yeah, that we can leverage existing platforms, of course, further improve, and then uh, build on that to, to finally um, also provide a service like teleoperation. So I think that's maybe currently there is a, still a split and these are isolated um, platforms when it starts to be introduced, 
But in the long end and, and even midterm, I would I would argue this needs to come together because teleoperation is nothing else than the original on stop button, but in a much more advanced function. Really, it might it's it started more than twenty years ago. You were somewhere on the road and you needed help. You pushed the on star button and someone called you and then the rest of the process started. And teleoperation is more or less something like that, just in a much more advanced and, and more fancy uh, way. And that needs to come together, the whole process chain behind that. That's a very good analogy, actually, uh, in terms of how you've gone from a manual to an automated process, I suppose. that That's very, very, very perceptive. Um, we're getting a lot of questions with regards uh, things on a global basis. Um, so I know Johannes, you you talked uh, earlier about connectivity and uh, and how Deutsche Telekom are you know linked across on a global basis on connectivity. Um, but what about compatibility and the interoperability? for such systems, because we know that in different regions, in different countries, we're going to get different quality of service, in, not just on the communications. Um, but also the bigger question, I suppose, within the automotive industry, uh, uh, you know, is there a need for a standard for, for teleoperations that everyone should be working against? Uh, or to create, to to get that global scale and, and, and that certainty as well. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Johannes, and, and guys, you know, chip in on this one. Um, may I start with the last question? Of course, in, uh, indeed, there are two questions in, in one. Uh, so let, let us start with the last part of, of standardizing teleoperation solutions. Um, I would say it depends on the on the on the use case or class of use cases where a teleoperated driving solution is is used yeah so if you use teleoperation for instance in a mining with heavy trucks yeah this this could be a let's say an isolated separated solution only for these type of uh, use cases if you would use teleoperation for valley parking yeah in a parking garage i would assume it makes no sense to have a teleoperated driving solution only for one car manufacturer because you know a valley parking for from a parking garage provider it makes only sense if there is some sort of standardized solution because not only one car manufacturer wants to park a certain car in the parking garage but also other car manufacturers would do, would like to do the same so the hurdles the obstacles are for all of them more or less the same so teleoperated driving is teleoperated driving. The, the solution for these type of edge cases, as Amit has shown, then of course as, as some sort of standardization is, is, a, is a, it would, would be a realistic and, and a efficient efficient uh, thing. So with regard to global availability, of course, you know uh, we as as the mobile network operator community know how to provide global standards. Yeah. So if you uh, leave your plane in, in, in China, then you can rely on mobile network <laughs> cellular standards, which work um, uh, all over the globe, not only from a technical basis, but also from a contractual and commercial basis. So, so roaming contracts, which are today uh, made for IP connection and of course voice connection and, and other type of services related to the, to the cellular coverage, these um, um, roaming contracts need to be um, uh, enhanced by features like providing quality of service, as I have said, or providing low latency and guarantees uh, to, uh, to, to, um, to a user equipment or a vehicle or to, to other um, um, uh, devices. And that is something where we as operators are working on to extend, to expand our roaming contracts in a way that these type of additional features and functionalities can be provided also on a global basis. So related and comparable to, to roaming agreements, you, you can expect that also quality of service will be provided on a global basis. Great. And, and sort of related to that, we talked about uh, saving lives uh, with this uh, solution in teleoperations. 
Uh, and we've had a number of questions come in um, about liability. And um, I know you're not lawyers, uh, but maybe you could give your view with regards to liability. Who's going to be liable if this fails? Or do we look at it in that perspective? Mm. If, if mm -hmm. I may start, and uh, maybe Ahmed, uh, uh, Joa, you can also add something uh, to that. Um, you know, liability. If if you take if you take a fully automated system, as such, you know, what will the automated system do if something goes wrong in the automation process? Of course, it fails back to a safe level, which means normally in the car industry. You need to stop the vehicle on the right hand side or on the left hand side in in, in the in the um, British uh, countries or in Australia, India, um, it, it, to to get the vehicle in, into a safe mode. So so that is that is always the level where a car manufacturer needs to bring his vehicle if something goes wrong. So if teleoperation is available as a fallback solution. The tailor operator could get the vehicle, could get access to the vehicle and drive the vehicle remotely, as Amit has shown. Of course, maybe not drive by wire, but also um, giving priority to certain rule sets, additional rule sets, and all these kind of different uh, control behaviors. If then something goes wrong because tailor operator fails, then the vehicle needs to fall back to the previous solution and needs to stop on the right hand side. So this is something which needs to be always in place to make sure that the whole system is in a safe state continuously. Okay. And in, in terms, um, of, in terms of, yeah. um, so just to, to give you again a, a kind of an analogy, um, already today, with uh, sometimes uh, 50, uh, 50 or more suppliers in, in one vehicle. Um, different software uh, and, and controllers working together. Liability is already a very complex issue, right? So the ultimate li liability in front of the customer has the manufacturer and, and he's backed up by, of course, contracts, first of all, and then it, it becomes more and more complex to figure out who was, um, where was the fault, yeah? Who was causing uh, the, the, the risk, the danger, the fatality? And that we already do also for connected cars, of course, we have a very um, sophisticated uh, measurement and monitoring system. So we can really uh, see what type, or what, what kind of service did not work properly. Currently, the, the majority of these services are just convenience or maybe operational efficiency, but it's still it's a damage to the OEM's um, brand. If if you if you bought, for example, a very expensive infotainment system and it is not available, yeah, imagine that in a luxury brand, people will complain and that causes a lot of damage. And we are ultimately responsible to deliver that service. Um, so that and it's it's just getting a little bit more complex, I would say, and of course more dangerous. But you need the, that's why you need this experience to deal with these complex environments. It has a contractual um, implication, of course, but it also has a lot. It comes a lot with technology, and you need to be able to, of course, deliver functional safety. First of all, uh, that's that's a tough challenge, and of course, then be able to whatever monitor at all time. Uh, all these tiny little pieces, whether or not they work. And and, and just one last comment, um, a sensor just five degrees out of the original position because of a not so well repair. And we know we all know these, these repair shops, yeah, sometimes third party repair shops who potentially have not the capability to do this right. This can cause a lot of um, risk to the car. And, potentially not even noticed until a fatal accident happens. Yeah, so it's really getting a lot more complex than today. Ahmed, have you got anything you could add to that? Only 10 seconds. It's uh, it's not, as I just said, it's not a 
much more complex than the existing situation where you have contracts, you have service level agreements, there are known performance metrics that a certain provider commits to, and using those contracts, you, as long as everything is recorded, you can then reverse engineer and analyze what went wrong. And is it because a certain vendor is at fault because of a commitment to, to reach a certain service level or a certain performance metrics and did not? Or was it a human mistake? So it's it's not very different than a than an accident, God forbid, that took place today. And then you you analyze what happened. Was it because the mechanic mechanic was supposed to test the brakes and he didn't, but he he did say that he did, and that's his fault? Or was it the driver, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? I'd like to squeeze one more question in from from the audience. I've got so many questions from the audience right now, um, but. If I can go around to all three of you on this last question, um, in terms of what do you see as the biggest barriers for the adoption of uh, teleoperations in automotive? Is it, you know, regulation, safety, lack of, lack of standards, international standards? Is it the insurance liability thing we talked about, or our trust of users, I suppose, uh, as, as well? Um, Maybe we start with you, Ahmed, on that one because obviously you've you've dealt with end users and customers on that. Uh, it's it's maybe surprising to some people, but I would I would say regulation is a very important factor, and we see the differentiation between uh, countries and geographies that actually mandate. There are about ten geographies, including UK. Uh, Japan, Sweden, and states in, in the U.S., like Florida, California, et cetera, that, that mandate and necessi necessitates teleoperation for the deployment of a, of a driverless vehicle on public streets. Uh, and in those places, you see a very strong pull from, from customers, from organizations uh, for a teleoperation uh, platform, for a teleoperation provider, versus other countries where if you do not have um, such a mandate, you do not have such a regulator that says you need teleoperation to, to deploy something, then it goes slower. And not only it goes slower, then there's also, you know, hiccups and, and, and boundaries where it's very hard to deploy on the national, on the national level. You, you can only deploy at certain areas and you need special approvals and it makes the, the things more bureaucratic and difficult. And it is already a challenge to, to deploy without all those regulatory uh, uh, hoops that you need to jump through. So we, we see a, a big difference between countries that, that mandate teleoperation and countries who do not, that do not. Um, and I would say for a global adoption, you must have those frameworks in place. Uh, when you do, everything goes much, much, much faster without, of course, compromising on the, on the safety of the deployment. Okay, thanks. Um, Joachim or Johannes, from a DT perspective? I, I can only second what, what uh, Amit has said. So I think regulation is a very important topic. We know this very well from the German situation right now. We are working intensively with the German Ministry of Transport uh, to provide the regulation which, which allows on the first side um, the operator, the tiller operator, but also with, uh, with, um, um, agrees that the tiller operated driving functionality needs to be in place if a level four, level five vehicle is allowed to, to drive under certain conditions on the road or even on a, on a, a certain a spot like a parking garage. So a proper regulation is, is a very important um, prerequisite uh, to, to speed up the deployment of these uh, type of technologies. And maybe a final word, you know, if you, if you compare the huge investments of the car manufacturers with regard to automation, of course, we, we need to work jointly together to monetize these type of investments. And uh, tailor operation is a very good, uh, very good method uh, to provide, um, let's say, a, a, an, an infrastructure uh, to, to deal with these, um, with these edge uh, uh, case hiccups which might occur, and uh, therefore um, proper regulation is very important to that. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, we've run out of time now, and um, I'd just like to 
thank uh, Johannes, Joachim, uh, and Ahmed. Um, thank you very much. And just to remind the audience, we didn't get through all your uh, questions, obviously, on here today, but we will publish a blog uh, and hopefully get answers to those particular questions you sent in. And in the next couple of weeks, I believe, we'll also have a recording of this webinar so you can check back on the GSMA website. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining today and have a good day.